You're interested in Duke's collaborative MBA program and intrigued by its general management curriculum and the strength of its entering class as revealed by its newest class profile. But you're also unsure how you can make your case for acceptance. Then you need to pull up a chair. In today's podcast, Fuqua's Dean of Admissions is pulling back the curtain on what Duke seeks in applicants. Welcome to Admission Straight Talk, the podcast dedicated to graduate admissions and helping you approach the application process thoughtfully and successfully. Your host is Accepted's founder and world-renowned admissions guru, Linda Abraham. At Accepted, our mission is to get you to that unforgettable moment when you read your acceptance email and shout, yes, I'm in, confident you'll be attending the perfect program to help you launch the career of your dreams. Welcome to the 434th episode of Admission Straight Talk. Thanks for tuning in. Before I introduce our guest, I have a question for you. Are you ready to apply to your dream MBA programs? Are you competitive at your target programs? Acceptance MBA admissions calculator can give you a quick reality check. Just go to accepted.com slash MBA quiz, complete the quiz, and you'll not only get an assessment, but tips on how to improve your qualifications. Plus, it's all free. Again, use the calculator at accept.com slash MBA quiz to obtain your complimentary assessment. It gives me great pleasure to welcome back to Admission Straight Talk, Sherry Hubert, Associate Dean of Admissions at Duke University's Fuqua School of Business. Sherry earned her bachelor's at Dartmouth and her MBA at Harvard. She worked at several elite companies and in 2009 became director of recruitment for the Peace Corps. In 2012, she returned to the MBA world when she became the associate dean of MBA admissions for Georgetown McDonough, which I think is around the time that we met. And then she joined Duke Fuqua as associate dean of admissions in October 2017. Sherry, welcome to Admissions Straight Talk. Thanks so much, Linda. It's so wonderful to see you again. I'm glad to hear that you're healthy and doing well and you're right. We, I think we first met when I was at Georgetown. So I think it was, and it was shortly nice. after you became a dean there, right? That's it was right. very soon That's after, right? right. So it's nice every year to be able to connect with you and talk with you. So thank and you it's so much my pleasure invitation. as well. You're very welcome. It's my pleasure as well. Okay, let's start with the basics, okay? In case listeners aren't that familiar with the MBA program at Duke, can you give an overview and focus more on its rather distinctive structure? Sure, absolutely. Um, you know, I think our curriculum is a huge asset in helping students really tailor their MBA to their specific needs and interests as they're going through the two-year program. You know, the curriculum is designed to allow students to have both breadth in terms of the business fundamentals and the leadership components through the core, and then as well as a deeper specialization should they be interested with our concentrations. We have 16 concentrations, as well as certificates in our second degree, which is the MSTEM the um, Master's of uh, Management Studies and Technology Management Certificate degree. Each of those concentrations and certificates really allow students to customize their experience based on their career interests or their own personal interests. You know, our students start their first month in the program all in a course called the Summer Institute. And we really revamped that last year. It's a hands-on program, three courses that really emphasize how to Think up through business challenges critically and ethically, how to take ownership of your work, even if you're working for somebody else, how to find ways of common, to bring common purpose to a team as you're working together. And this particular set of courses really prepare them for the next two years. It's kind of a level setting course. Okay. The remainder of the academic year is broken down into four six week terms. Um, and each term meets twice a week for two hours and 15 minutes. Unique to us, we actually don't have classes on Wednesdays as opposed to Fridays, like some schools. Yeah. And that really <laughs> enables our students to stay together over the weekend, to create community and to really be connected, I think, even more. I also think one thing that's unique is the way in which we structure our uh, first year leadership teams. Um, they're four to five person teams. They are called consequential leadership teams or C-lead teams for short. And the nice thing is they're actually managed or mentored by second year students who are selected to be our Center for Leadership and Ethics Fellows. So first year students off the bat get peer mentored and managed by second year students, so which, is, which I think is, is quite unique. So it allows the second year students to get some hands-on leadership peer mentoring practice, but also at the same time, we have uh, true support for our first year students as they're going through and getting acclimated to the core. 
That's great. Yeah. And I also, this is more drawing from the, our, our previous interview. Remember you mentioned that um, there's, there's IQ, there's EQ, and at Pukwai, I believe there's also DQ, if I recall, right? Correct. correct. Decency, a decency quotient. And I think that's something that's very distinctive about Fuqua. Could you, could you touch on that for a minute? Oh yeah, absolutely. So I think the IQ and the EQ is pretty self-evident. So, so the decency is, there's a couple of principles that we all espouse and we've actually created frameworks for decency so that students can really have lived experiences and proof points and it shows up in their experiences. And so the, the first thing is the community commits to you know, embracing habits of humility and empathy when dealing with each other and understanding different perspectives and different backgrounds. They act with integrity. They're transparent, they're honest. Uh, the principles include things like being accountable to ourselves and to others, both when it's easy and when it's hard, right? Um, and then, I, you know, the last couple of things are caring respect for all in the community and then elevating others throughout the community. And some of the ways in which the frameworks show up is, for instance, across both the first and second year cohorts, you know, in terms of learning about others and appreciating difference that shows up in our daring dialogues or people talks. We have, again, the Center on Leadership and Ethics has a number of speaking, you know, sessions to help them become even more effective leaders. We have what we call Woke Wednesdays. We have implicit bias training and identity workshops that are now infused through the first year throughout. Uh, and it's kind of not required or mandatory, but highly encouraged and everyone participates. Um, in terms of developing a habit, or again, you know, this notion of decency is how do you develop a habit of including and respecting others? That shows up a lot in the first year through the C-lead or the consequential leadership teams, really allowing teams to create their own norms how are they going to share feedback with each other? How do they have difficult conversations? Um, how do they really support each other throughout their academic growth? We also have what we call paired principles. And there are six paired principles. So a few samples of the paired principles, authentic engagement, impactful uh, stewardship, loyal community, supportive ambition, uncompromising integrity, and collective diversity. So, <laughs> some, so these are all though demonstrated by students and then students twice a year in the fall and the spring will actually nominate their peers and their classmates to be recipients of these awards. So who, are, mm -hmm. who in the community this demonstrates this, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then in terms of the second year students, the last you know, component of this whole decency framework is really about setting an example, leading by example, right? And by the time you're a second year, hopefully you're, you've started to really be able to have opportunities to kind of flex those leadership capabilities and muscles. And so there's all kinds of fellowships, right? It's not just the admissions fellows, which are the ones who are interviewing all of our uh, incoming students, but also the co-fellows who are responsible for the leadership teams. We have career fellows who actually support our first year students as they're going through the recruiting process and helping them prepare for their internships and their interviews. We have what we call case fellows, people very interested in social enterprise and social advancement that also, again, work with students, faculty, industry, nonprofits to really help uh, provide social impact. So there are all of these different ways that, you know, from the first year to the second year that we try and give students a real way of exhibiting decency throughout their experience. And that's really kind of this notion of decency and how we, how it comes to life really. Um, as so student. cultivating it mm -hmm. very much. Let's, let's, uh, it was fascinating. And I'm, I'm glad I asked the question because it, yeah. it is something that's, Again, it's not some schools, all schools, I think, expect it, mm -hmm. but I think, and some do cultivate it, but I think it is more of a focus at, at Duke Fuqua. Fuqua. Yeah, we now, wanted it to be more than just a tagline, right? We want it to be more than just something that the dean said, but, you know, really like, okay, well, then if we're saying we want, we're looking for folks who are decent coming in, then how do we continue to cultivate that as a community um, once they're here? Yeah, yeah, and, you, and you're clearly doing it. Now, how has COVID-19 and the related restrictions affected the Fuqua MBA experience? And what were some of the silver linings that you're going to keep? Yeah, you know, I think the pandemic has taught us that it is hard to fully replicate the transformation experience entirely through a virtual format. Um, there's something special that happens in experiential programs when individuals are able to interact in person, when yeah. there's more organic and serendipitous experiences that happen to help to bond relationships. Um, 
and cultivate culture. And so, you know, with that said, though, the benefits that we did see was that because we were virtual, really our students um, had this really unique opportunity to have learned how to both thrive in and lead virtual teams. And those are skills that they, you know, they really can take with them in a post-pandemic business environment and after they graduate that will serve them well, right? You know, how do you manage more virtual teams? And as, as we're seeing um, just as staff and faculty, this notion of remote work is becoming more salient. And so how are, you know, how are you able to continue to create a culture of inclusion in a virtual format where well, our students were able to do that? They lived through it. They took, um, they, they were leading in it, right? They themselves created opportunities for inclusion for, for their student, for their classmates and themselves. And they can take these skills with them that are portable when they go back out in the work world and have to manage teams that are very much uh, could be virtual as well. So that's, I think, something that was a silver lining that came out of it. You know, other things that will probably stick and we're, and we're still in the process of having that play out is that we saw that um, for some in terms of the recruiting, right? I mean, our recruiters may do larger information sessions virtually because those tend to not, you know, they tend to be a little bit one way. They don't involve as much engagement. They're delivering information, not necessarily needing to, you know, receive a lot of engagement from the audience mm -hmm. and from the recipients. But then, like, so they do the virtual information sessions, um, but then they would come to campus for in-person, smaller, more intimate engagement opportunities or come to campus or perhaps have, you know, have people do their interviews in person, right? So those situations in which there needs to be more of a in per, you know more of a connectivity and relationship building opportunity could be in person whereas you know other larger events might be more virtual so that's probably going to be a bit sticky and then you know in terms of admissions we're still conducting all of our events virtually for this remaining calendar year and you know we'll reassess to see the types of events that make sense and that are most valuable to do in person so for instance um, our thought process is that perhaps once you're an admitted student it's much more valuable to you to be able to come to a campus, see and feel people, meet people in person before you make your final decision, right? And so what are the, you know, what are those occasions or opportunities that make most, that are most important to you to have an in-person experience? But still, we would probably not do away with a lot of the um, application or perspective types of events that are virtual because it really was wonderful to be able to access so many individuals around the world and have them access us as well. And so we will continue to retain that opportunity, but just try and think a bit more critically about what, what, what in-person opportunities are much more valuable to both the admitted student and for our, our, us as well. Right. And, and have a hybrid format that we'll put do, in place. Do you see yourself, and then here I'm talking about admissions, let's say, let's hope, pray, COVID is completely conquered, okay. okay? And we can travel safely. Do you see yourself having, you know, the same number of in-person recruiting events in the future? Or is that hard to say? Is it, you know, it's like too hard to imagine at the yeah. moment. Well, I think that, so we really did ratchet up a lot of our recruiting events. Online. And to sure. some, exactly, virtually. And to some extent, it is easier to- Oh, much, and much less expensive. Yeah. Right, right. Easier um, for both parties. Exactly. Easier for both parties. And so there's some benefit to that. So I don't want to say that we would ever go back to 100% only in person. I think what we would need to do is figure out either a hybrid where we're doing, we're replicating that in-person experience in a virtual format for people who can't make it to campus, or we are somehow creating a hybrid experience where some, you know, where simultaneously there are people in person experiencing an event at the same time as they're doing it virtual. I think that's a little harder, right? Um, and so it may be that we're kind of creating more events, right? Right. That are both, you know, the, this this event, even though it the even though it may not look the same in a virtual context, it's still the same event so that we can make it accessible for people who can't physically get to us. So for instance, with our campus visit program, you know, I could imagine right now there it's a hundred percent virtual campus visit program. Right. So we reimagined an in-person experience, but virtually, well, once we are able to have welcome people back on campus, we would 
you know, continue to have in-person opportunities for these campus visit programs, perhaps every Tuesday and Thursday, right? And then Mondays and Fridays are for, right. oh, so, so I the other way around, Mondays and Fridays could be in person because people come, they want to spend the weekend. Right, 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 right. That's right. the time. But Tuesday and Thursdays might be the virtual version of that. Right, right. So that we're yeah. at the same time keeping both, but managing that from a you know, capacity perspective. No, I understand. I understand. Now, that's great. I was actually asking more about, you know, you used to travel the world going and having hosting receptions and stuff in different cities. Um, do you see ever going back to it on any level or, or yeah, curtailing absolutely. it or? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I think we'll go back to it. Yes. You know, I think people have to feel comfortable, though, to be honest, you know, yeah. our team yeah. has to feel comfortable. We, you know, right now, Duke has a, a list of countries that is restricted or not restricted in terms of travel. So we'd have to pay close attention to that. Yeah. But absolutely, there, you know, we're not saying that there's no value in in person, especially when you're traveling to other countries. It's just that, you know, the silver lining is that we actually would probably touch more people virtually. But yes, there's still going to be value in physically traveling to okay. all parts of the world as well as domestic states. Right. What changes has Fuqua made to the curriculum this year? Um, you know, it's been an ongoing evolution. You know, we're com always committed to innovating um, to make sure our curriculum remains relevant. Right now, we're still assessing what worked well online that we want, might want to incorporate in future courses. Uh, for example, we were able to recruit a wider number of alumni to be protagonists in our in speakers in our classes and really? courses, which worked well. Last year, we launched three new courses. So the curriculum really changed drastically last year for last year's incoming students. And we created, there are three courses. They're part of the Summer Institute. One's called Creating Common Purpose in a World That's Divided. The second course is Entrepreneurial Mindset in Action. And then there's a Leading Technology Change course as well. And last year, these three courses were delivered in hybrid format. This year, they'll be 100% delivered in person. And so that will also create some learnings and opportunities. What's the difference? Because many of those courses are experiential in nature. They have simulations and exercises. So what we've heard so far is that, especially the entrepreneurial mindset in action course, there are a number of different, you know, interesting experiential uh, exercises that are done. And so to be able to do that in person has been really beneficial to students. And I think something that, you know, um, is new and different. Um, so I think it's it's maybe not the curriculum itself, but the mode in which we were operating that is new and different. In addition to the you know the curricular those types of curriculum uh, curricular changes, um, our faculty are continually to update and infuse real world and relevant you know issues into their courses, especially as it pertains to diversity and uh, race, social justice issues. Uh, we have a you know one of our healthcare courses that started to talk about healthcare disparities in race. We have a diversity and talent management course that is new. Uh, we have uh, one of our accounting professors does really uh, great research in on bond uh, financing disparities with historically black colleges versus non historically mm -hmm. black colleges. So some of those things. And again, I think our faculty are also um, realizing that you know there's benefit in really you know, capturing and, and, and infusing what's happening in society and as it changes, it evolves as a result of either the pandemic or as a result of, you know, many of the social changes that are occurring and making sure that our, that, that gets in, incorporated into our courses. And so I say, I would think, I'd say those are the kinds of curricular um, kind of tweaks and innovations that are occurring right now as we, again, continue to manage through this you know we're not over the pandemic no we're not <laughs> right we're still managing through it i think you know many of us thought that it was just a one-year phenomenon and we'd be you know this would be post-pandemic and we're not yet there so no no definitely not mm -hmm. it might also be becoming endemic like the cold or the flu i mm -hmm. mean we don't we don't know at this point it's just not clear right right um fuqua in the past offered lots of global study opportunities one of the impacts of COVID, of course, has been that, that those have been dr drastically curtailed. Mm -hmm. What's come in place? Does Fuqua have any plans, plans to reinstate some of those global, global treks and opportunities or yeah. what are the guidelines? What do you see happening in that area? Yeah, you're referring to our global academic travel experience and that, you know, we did have to curtail the travel component. And so we're really focused on, that team is really focused on bringing that back. Uh, we really would want to have that as a component of the, of the experience that happened, you know, it's the first year, 
very, very popular. It's a, you know, a course that, you know, that goes over about a couple of months, but then it culminates into actual travel for a couple of weeks to the country. And you know, in the past, uh, students have gone to Peru, South Africa, China. It really changes based on the uh, you know, interest of the faculty, interest of students. So that's had to be placed on hold, but they are looking at bringing it back, hopefully in March and May of wow. the coming year. They're looking to see. Um, again, it'll depend on the countries that we can go to. It might take on a slightly different format, right, to make sure that everyone's safe. But but that is the goal is to try and, and allow students to get back to travel. But again, we, we have to do it safely. In terms of our exchange programs, again, very, very popular. You know, pre-pandemic, we had 20 different relationships with institutions. We have been able to in this past, like we're looking this fall, being able to have a few students go on some exchanges. So a lot of it depends on the other school institution too, and if they're able to send people here. So, but we, it does look like we might be able to have a few students um, go on some exchanges this fall. Again, you know, usually happens in the fall and the spring and they take on different, they're flexible, right? So you could have as short as two weeks or as long as a whole term and everything in between. Typically, we have five to eight students who participate in a fall exchange for the entire term. We have 15 to 20 who might participate in a short term, like May time frame exchanges. And we have over 100 students who participate in the very kind of short winter breaks, those kinds of um, exchanges. Again, I think a lot of it will depend on how this new variant plays out and what the travel restrictions are. But yeah, the, the you know, we're taking baby steps, but definitely moving towards trying to figure out where can we send students safely. And then students have their own treks that they organize too. And again, it's about, it's a matter of trying to figure out where can that be done in a safe environment, given, because we do, we're doing a lot of testing of our students as well in terms of entry-level testing, surveillance test, testing, contact tracing testing. So, you know, there's a lot of precautions in place. Right. Now, before we turn to the application itself, one, one more kind of general question, and that is, is there anything that you would like um, people to know about Duke Fuqua that they basically usually don't know or miss that you'd like to dispel? Um, you know, I think with that question, you know, probably focus on our entrepreneurial offerings, to be honest. I don't necessarily know that people have a great appreciation for all the opportunities from an entrepreneurial perspective that exist at Fuqua. You know, we, as I mentioned, we really believe entrepreneurship is a, is a mindset. And so regardless of whether or not you decide to start your own company or venture, or you go into an organization that's established and you are an innovator in that space, that's really where we're focused on um, ensuring that our students are kind of level set. And I think we're one of the only top business schools who have a required course on entrepreneurship in, in, the, student, in, the, in the first year, and that's the Entrepreneurial Mindset in Action course. So that's one thing. Um, I would also say that uh, we believe strongly in, uh, for those who are interested in creating their own venture, there are opportunities to do that too. And we do have students who graduate having started their own businesses. We have a, a wonderful student who created a business called BioMilk. And um, they make lab-grown breast milk, human breast milk. Really? And Whoa. Raised, and yeah, and they've raised 3.5 million already. Um, she graduated a couple years ago. And so, you know, we have examples of students who, you know, within the program, because the program is set up to, we have a course called New Ventures, and it's set up to really help uh, people who want to start their own company with kind of the, you know, the discovery, the develop and the deliver kind of framework that they need to walk them through the roadmap they need to walk them through. There's also a broad range of ways to assist our students in financing their, their operation as well that I don't think are very well known. So we have com competitive financial tools, we have prototyping grants, we have a summer internship grants so for someone who wants to be a founder as opposed to going to a startup mm -hmm. or going to do a traditional internship. Sub, you know, providing some financing to subsidize and support that person's ability to focus on their, on their uh, idea. We have a loan, loan assistance programs that will, um, you know, help students who graduate who are trying to found their own business and, and will help with the deferment of their uh, debt for a couple of years or, a couple, or it covers their interest payments for a couple of years. Um, we have a fast pitch competition for students as well. We have resources that are not just within Fuqua, but within Duke 
um, ecosystem of inter uh, entrepreneurship and innovation as well. And then we just started a partnership with uh, North Carolina Central, which is a historically black college. And so again, uh, uh, have a pitch contest as well as other resources for black founders or for you know people interested in creating more social equity within entrepreneurship as well. So a lot of different aspects of entrepreneurship and we think about it very holistically um, at Fuqua, which I think not everyone has an appreciation for. We have a new course actually that is focused on acquisition so entrepreneurship through acquisition, right? Mm -hmm. So the many students who want to create their search fund to, to acquire companies. And so we have a new course that's focused on that too. So lots of different avenues and aspects of entrepreneurship. All right, great. It's, it sounds really, very exciting. Now let's turn to the application. Fuqua's signature question is 25 things. Please share with us 25 random thoughts about, about you. The admissions committee wants to get to know you beyond the professional academic achievements listed in your resume and transcript. Share with us important life experiences, your hobbies, achievements, fun facts, or anything that helps us understand what makes you who you are. That's a great question. I can tell you that we love working on it with, with clients. Um, do you have any tips for it? Yes. We, Go. I love it too. I love Go it for too. it. It's our favorite, it's our favorite to essay. We do it ourselves with an admission. So anytime we hire a new staff member, they have to also create their own 25 list. So we, we feel your pain for those <laughs> applicants <laughs> who always struggle with the question. But you know, I would say, remember the, that why and how are much more interesting than the what. Um, what you've done or are doing is easily replicated, especially if you come from certain industries like consulting or, or banking, right? Or if you're interested in going into certain industries that are very overrepresented with MBA students. So I always uh, counsel people to really focus on the why and the context, because that's really where you can differentiate yourself. That's where your story is not unique to anybody else's story, even if what you're doing is, right? Um, so that's one tip I would say you know, consider um, not just the context for the 25 random facts, but we also have a second essay that focuses on what will you contribute to the community. And again, you know, why is whatever you're saying you're going to contribute or the clubs that you want to get engaged in, why is that important to you? Where does that come from? You know, um, is really important and helps us understand you from a number of different uh, uh, perspectives. And also helps us understand this notion of decency and where is that, you know, how will that manifest itself? Um, I think it's okay to infuse humor in your fun facts. So please I, I encourage people to do that. Um, I didn't, I'd avoid, you know, trite or overuse or superficial kinds of things, <laughs> uh, very short answers, right, with, with not a lot of context. Um, perhaps focus more on your personal than the professional because you yeah. know, there are other areas of, the, of your application where you can really understand your professional accomplishments. You know, talk to your friends, your family, they know you, they can, you know, ask them what are the interesting things about you, what are the things that they, you know, think are, are unique or different or even frustrating and irritating, you know, um, and then just finally don't be afraid to be vulnerable. Some of the most interesting facts are ones where people really open up and share, you know, an experience that may have stretched them or allowed them to grow in ways that they hadn't expected or that was, you know, challenging to be quite honest to them. Okay. okay, great. Those are great tips. Thank you very, very much. Can you discuss the interview process at Fuqua and specifically the difference between open interviews and interviews by invitation? Sure. Well, open interviews are essentially self-initiated interviews um, by the applicant versus an invitation that comes from the admissions committee. That, it, you know, that's a at the basic level, that's really what the open interview process is. It's just your opportunity. We really believe um, that the interview provides us a unique opportunity to really get to know an individual in their own words. And so, you know, we wanted to have provide as many opportunities for our applicants to be able to connect with us in person and connect with our students in person. It's virtually now, but, you know, figuratively in person. <laughs> Uh, so, so that's really what the open interview period is. Um, you know, all applicants, regardless of the round in which they apply, are eligible to interview during that period. What we'll do is we will attach your interview to the round in which you actually apply if it's not the early action round. Um, and, you know, I would say the only other thing is that they're done on a first come first serve basis. We ask that you at least give us 48 hours to request uh, that. The period is August 23rd through, this year is August 23rd through October 12th. 
And so, and we really encourage any reapplicant to participate in that open interview period as well. All you have to do is have started your application to be able to participate and then schedule the interview from then on based on a first come first serve basis. But it really is a unique opportunity. And I would say, take advantage if you feel you're prepared, right? I mean, for, we recognize that for some, it might be that period of time might be a little early. You may not have been able to do requisite you know, research or prepared yourself, you know, just in terms of your own self-reflection. So don't feel so compelled to do it if you don't feel prepared. You know, the ultimate goal is to feel prepared because it is your one and only interview. Right, right. Yeah, and okay. so otherwise, if you decide not to, that's okay. But know that what will happen is once you do apply, then we will um, take a look at your application and then determine whether or not we'd like to invite you to an interview or not. And all students are, all admitted students, I should say, are interviewed. Correct. So all admitted students are interviewed, but not all applicants are interviewed. Right, right. No, I got that. Okay. Now, Fuqua is famous for its collaborative culture, and we discussed the decency quotient, you know, Team Fuqua. Can you both describe it and perhaps provide an example or uh, in the manifestation of, of the culture? You, you did, a, and, and I have to say that I was uh, looking at my notes or listening rather to the webinar that you did for AGAC a few weeks ago. And there were some great examples there. I don't remember if, if you remember them at this point, but um, you know, it was, it was really impressive in terms of how individual students put the well-being of others as number one. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's, so I, I guess I'll describe Team Fuga this way. It's a way of working that allows you to bring out the best in others. And by doing so, you therefore then bring out the best in yourself, if that makes sense. That makes a lot based, of sense. Okay. And it's based a lot on of idea, sense. <laughs> I mean, it's essentially based on the idea that, you know, in believing your success is my success, you know, very simple. Mm -hmm. And we definitely continuously have these examples, although sometimes they are, you know, unless you experience them, it's hard to really imagine and, and have it come to life. So there are things that you would expect to occur in an MBA program that says that they're focused on teamwork, right? Like, you know, students speaking up on behalf of others in the classroom, right? Supporting your comments in the classroom, expected. Helping prep for an interview when you're both competing for the same opportunity, you've heard that before. Um, you know, choosing to lean in to moments that might be difficult um, for you or for others in times where it might have been easiest to just lean out, right? But I think what Team Fuqua is, is those moments that are unexpected. And I'll give you an example. So moments in which you don't necessarily, something happens or you do something or something is done for you, but no one is asking for credit. Sometimes you don't even know who's done it, but it still gets done. Um, and it happens organically, even without folks, you know, again, sometimes even knowing who's doing the good deed. Some of it's manifest again, well, it's manifest. And then what happens is it's recognized through these seven pair principles and the awards, right? Um, and so that's, I think, also how it, it allows the community to perpetuate and build upon itself, right? Because people acknowledge and, and recognize the good deeds, even though the person who did the good deed wasn't necessarily looking for that recognition. But so for instance, one example is a st one student that I know, he lost a, a BCG and a Bain interview. So he interviewed for both mm. firms. He did not get, got turned down. Lots of classmates who we actually helped prepare for their, for their, for similar interviews did get the internship, right? Mm -hmm. He did get the offer. He did not. But those students made a point of lifting him up when they found out that he didn't get it. They lifted him up. They made sure he was okay. They focused their attention on um, celebrating him and, and supporting him in the moment, as opposed to considering or thinking about themselves and the fact that they just had some good news, right? And they took the time to thank him for the support that he provided to them, knowing that what you know that that support turned out to be successful. And so it was again about um, supportive ambition, right? You know, putting someone else's uh, interests, concerns, uh, issues in, for, in before your own. That's one example. Another example is the night before uh, a, a major accounting exam, one of the section's members um, actually lost his, his dog ran away. Mm -hmm. And every single member, a classmate of his went out. This was the night before an accounting exam. They went out and helped him look for that dog. 
Oh gosh. <laughs> and, and the good news is they found the dog and they all did well on the accounting exam, right? I mean, so again, it's in the moment, unscripted, you know, it was impromptu team building, but yeah. it was about a higher level need or concern or something that's really more important than the accounting exam in that moment for that <laughs> student, right? I mean, yeah. you know how much pets are like our own family. Yeah, <laughs> for yeah, me it yeah. Is. Right, great example of loyal community, loyal community, which is one of our peer principles. Another student um, during the pandemic, there were students who were quarantined as a result of the pandemic, couldn't get out. And so he arranged for his classmates to go by their apartments and, and put up wonderful, encouraging signs in their windows to say, hey, we're, we're here for you. We're thinking about you um, to lift their spirits. And then finally, uh, and an interest, you know, another one that I, I just learned about was one of our students, a really beloved student, Indian American, he, unbeknownst to anyone, put together care packages for every single member of our Black and Latinx MBA organization during the height of the uh, George Floyd, Ahmaud Aubrey, and Breonna Taylor um, injustices. And he didn't need any recognition. I don't even know to this day if they know that he was the one who organized it, but he really, you know, again, was empathetic and knew that they were suffering and wanted to just show compassion and that there were classmates thinking of them. So it's those kinds of, and that's you know, collective diversity, another, another peer principle and loyal community. So those kinds of examples where it's, you know, it's kind of hard to, it sounds conjured and it's kind of hard to explain it, but when you experience it, it becomes real. It's, and it is distinctive. Mm -hmm. it, yeah. I mean, there are, there are, I think, many MBA programs where the, the culture is supportive. I, I do think that, you know, Fuqua goes a little bit beyond the, the norm, as you said. Now, I also recently got a press release from Fuqua announcing that it is enrolling its strongest class ever. Um, can you unwrap that a little bit? What does that mean? Sure. Um, you know, despite having recruited in the midst of a pandemic, <laughs> There were many headwinds that we were working in our favor, quite frankly, resulting in both a larger class and really the strongest class that we've had. And when I say strongest, I mean from a diversity perspective, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's We've had 48% women, which is the highest number of women we've had. In terms of racial diversity, 44%. In terms of underrepresented racial diversity, a quarter of the class who are US citizens uh, is underrepresented. You know, 37% of the class our international students, if you add in those who are dual, almost 50%. So that's, uh, you know, and they come from 54 different countries. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, not only is it diverse, but it's also the strongest in terms of kind of the academic quantitative kind of profile, work experience, those kinds of things as well. Uh, you know, our applications were up in uh, probably the largest volume since 2015. And then uh, we really, I think um, benefited from strong yield. So we had the highest yield ever in our history. Congratulations. Thank you. And all of those factors then, you know, just allowed us to be even more selective, uh, you know, this year than in sure. the past. So a lot of things working well, we don't take any of it for granted. We don't rest on our laurels. We know that there are, you know, you so can't. many things. Right? <laughs> I mean, you, you can't. can't. You know, and some of these things are absolutely a result of things that you've done and others are you know, industry effects and just good luck in, in some respects. So we're going to keep moving it forward and, and, and hope, hopefully we'll be able to continue that trend. So. For sure. What do you see coming down the pike for the MBA program? Um, you know, I think... To be honest, building on the momentum and, and equipping our students uh, to be future leaders, right? Focused on doing good, but, but also doing well. You know, I think because we just came off of starting a new curriculum, we came off of a really high in terms of our a great class. Um, we continue to remain relevant in terms of the courses that we're offering. You know, we see examples of our alumni doing really well. So I think at this point, the school is really just focused on, you know, continuing that momentum, uh, trying to figure out, you know, how do we make sure that this incoming class has a fantastic, you know, experience, right, in keeping folks safe as well, sure. and in and, and trying to understand how do we not only survive but thrive, um, you know, in a new normal, to be quite honest, I think yeah, I mean, that's I, pretty much what we're having, you know, I think we're, we're all having to come to the realization that this might be a new normal. And so how do we 
how do we thrive in it? Um, and what does that mean? And so right now, I think a lot of focus and energy is on that, making sure that our students um, feel good about their learning experience. And that was one of the reasons that we felt so strongly about bringing people back in, in person and also focus on our, you know, the staff and the faculty. Um, so just kind of keeping, keeping the ship moving in the right direction, but seeing kind of what's next as, you know, as this new normal unfolds. Right, right. And I, I you know, as you we were talking before, you know, the, we started the official podcast, I think that uh, this is probably becoming endemic, like, like the flu or, or whatever. I mean, I don't think we're, it doesn't look like we're ever going to really get rid of it. Right. Um, so we have to learn to live with it. Okay. Um, what would you have liked me to ask you? Uh, well, you did ask, I was going to say about the decency uh, okay. aspect. So I'm glad you asked that. I know you had uh, had a question about our process and kind of peeling right. back the layers. Um, yes. I'm happy to, I'm happy to. Yeah, please. Uh, I did. I did forget about that one. You're right. Uh, no worries. I, there's a lot that we could cover. So I um, totally respect that. Uh, let's see. So in, in terms of what's new, not much is new. Um, again, we're just, we wanted to keep things simple. Uh, so we retained the essay question. We have increased the word count just to give people a little bit more room to express themselves. Um, once someone does apply, what happens is our uh, operations coordinate, coordination team takes their application and people should know that they can actually apply, you know, with unofficial test scores or unofficial transcripts. But if anything's missing, our team will make sure that the, the applicants are made aware. So we get your application. Um, what happens is it is read by the first reader. And that person then determines whether or not, um, if you haven't interviewed already in our open period, whether or not we'll, you'll get an invitation for, for interviews. If you have, then we'll, that interview will be on file. There's a second reader then who reads your file after the interview comes in, regardless of when it's conducted, and then makes a determination, talks to the admissions committee. There can be either a decision to admit to waitlist or to deny. Um, after you know, two reads, multiple conversations in committee, because there's a committee for to determine invitation to interview, then there's a committee for the actual decision once the interview comes back. Is there like a, a grading system, a numerical grading system, or is it more of a qualitative analysis? Well, I mean, it's a bit of both. You know, we okay. have kind of a rubric, um, but it's definitely has the, you know, a qualitative component as well. Um, and really holistic. I mean, that's why there's so many conversations because <laughs> it doesn't all, it doesn't all kind of just neatly, you know, come down to numbers. Um, it really is a conversation on multiple levels and at multiple times. And so after the second read, which incorporates the interview, it, that file then goes to final decision or final committee. And then the final committee um, individuals will then sit and, and make a final determination based on the recommendations of both readers and take into consideration the interview. Um, and at that time, if it is a admit decision, then we do also discuss and determine scholarship. So there's no separate scholarship application. It's, it's all yeah. one, mm -hmm. one right. thing. Do you read a certain percentage of the files? So I read across programs because since they're 10 degree programs, we have a pretty, oh, you know, we have a, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so a very experienced daytime MBA program team. I sit on all final committee, uh -huh. but I have to admit, I don't read all files. So no, <laughs> <laughs> but I do sit on, I do sit in on the final admissions committee. And, and for those files that you do read, how do you approach them? Like, what do you read first? What do you look, you know, then I, how do you? That's a good question. So um, I like to read the, why they're interested in it first and what they hope to do. Mm -hmm. Both, you know, the plan A and plan B. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so I'll read kind of the essays, right? Both of those essays first, based on what they said that they were interested in. And then I'll go back and, and take a look at kind of their academics and, and their work experience. And leadership and involvement is really important in our decisioning. And so that's always a place that I also focus in on kind of their examples and experience in the leadership and involvement uh, space. Thank you so much for um, adding that question or, or, or 
putting it back in. I appreciate it. That was great. Thank you for your answers. And thank you very much for joining me today. Where can listeners and potential applicants learn more about Duke Fuqua's MBA program? Sure. You can visit us at www.fuqua.duke.edu. Okay, great. We're going to include links in the show notes at accept.com slash 434 to the site that Sherry just mentioned, as well as to related articles and show notes. Listener, thank you two for joining Sherry Hubert and me for our 434th episode. If you find the show worthwhile, I have a suggestion for you. Tell your MBA applicant friends. They'll thank you, and so do I. Quick reminder, don't miss the MBA admissions quiz. Find out if you are really ready to apply. Competitive at your target schools? Take the quiz at accept.com slash MBA quiz. Thanks again for coming. This is a Mission Straight Talk produced by Accepted, and I am your host, Linda Abraham. I'll talk to you again next week. Mm-hmm.